think we've talked about problem solving, conflict resolution, and negotiation through many places in this course already. So these are really common processes to collaboration, to interprofessional practice. Um, and you know, problem solving is something that you and I do all the time. It's part of our daily lives. Problem solving is actually how human beings are oriented. We are problem solving people. Um, so when I listened to Fro talking today about her furnace not working and she's got to problem solve how to get that furnace working because her house is getting really cold and who do you call and what do you do about the fuse and who needs to know what and where's my manual for my thermostat, she's going through a process of problem solving. Or when we get in our car to let's say come to the Learn Center and we've got to figure out where we're going to park when we get here, maybe we're not so familiar with it, maybe it was the first day. We're going through a series of problem solving. When we're thinking of the people that we work with and we're trying to get the services for them that they need and deserve, we're going through a process of problem solving. We all problem solve in every area of our life all the time. But in saying that, it is a very natural thing we could be doing it better. There are better processes for doing it and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're also going to talk very specifically today about conflict resolution. And I know conflict resolution or conflict is something that many of us are uncomfortable with, um, have had challenges in the past, don't always know how to, to deal with it. Conflict is, I, you know, I, I just really do want to acknowledge, conflict actually is a very difficult thing. We talk about it being absolutely necessary within any team and group work. It leads to better outcomes, it leads to better understandings among people. It actually leads to true collaboration, but in saying that, it's a difficult process to engage in. I wanted to share with you a little, a little bit about my experiences with conflict, because it's hard for someone like me to stand up here and talk about conflict and talk about ways that we can resolve it and it's all fine and it's all good and it leads to you know, better things and we should all engage in conflict knowing it's really, really difficult. I am, um, you know, throughout my life and in my practice, I have had some really difficult situations where conflict has arisen. And one of, the, one of the most dramatic things for me when I was a young nurse, and I wanted to share this one with you because it really made an impact. It, it actually, in some ways, directed the decision of my career as it moved from that point. Um, and I don't actually show up very well in this, this example. It's not like I, I dealt with the conflict well, I dealt with it really badly. Um, I was, it was my first job, so I was like a completely new nurse, and um, I was on an orthopedic rheumatology unit. And there was, I, 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 the nurse, the, there was a nurse in the team, and she wasn't really in my radar. I wasn't really paying attention to her. I didn't have a lot of contact with her. Um, so I really wasn't noticing. I don't know if I did anything to offend her. I don't know if I was taking something resources away from her. I have no idea. And, and that could have been just my na just being very naive, just not aware of the, the bigger picture of everything. I was just really struggling to try and you know fit in. I was struggling to figure out what I was supposed to be doing on this unit on a day-to-day -day basis. I was struggling with this bigger patient load than I had ever had before and procedures that I sort of knew how to do, but suddenly I was completely responsible for. So, you know, really difficult those early times going into practice independently. Um, things really came to a head one night where I was trying to care for my patients and I take equipment so I'd, I might need um, like the, the IV setup or I might need the blood pressure cuff. Um, we used to use PCA and I'd be bringing the equipment into the room and then the minute I'd turn around, that equipment would not be there, it'd be gone, it'd be just disappear. So what I needed, the resources I needed would just have vanished on me. It was really affecting what I was doing. I, couldn't, I could not function because I could not do the work that I needed to do. Nothing was timely. I was starting to not be able to do medications on time. I was starting to not be able to chart. I was starting to just lose it kind of all over. Um, and so what was happening was this, this nurse was um, feeling, I, I, I actually, you know what, I'm, I'm 
I don't actually know what the nurse was feeling. We, we never really spoke about it. Uh, my sense is that I may have been infringing on territory that I didn't understand, um, moving things, changing processes in the unit in ways that I didn't understand. I went up to the desk and I said to her, um, I noticed that you're, you're taking the things that I'm bringing to the room that I need to use with my patients. Can you tell me why that's happening? And um, she, she just started yelling at me right at that nursing station, yelling at me so loudly that I don't know anything, I taking all this stuff and you shouldn't be here. What, it, so it just like, whew, right, I don't, came at me and I don't know what was coming at me. I don't know what was happening for her. No idea what was happening for her in the moment. What I was experiencing in the moment was um, panic, like absolute panic, because it was very public. I'm very new. I'm worried about my manager. I'm worried about my colleagues. I'm worried about how I look as a nurse. Um, I'm actually capable. Um, and uh, so I've got all that going on, and I, I, you know, I can feel my adrenaline going. And I, I typically, in, in many situations, I might actually be more of a withdrawer. In this situation, I actually started yelling back. And if you ask Fro, I would probably be like the least person you'd imagine starting to yell in any environment like this. The level of my frustration and fear was so high that I was yelling back. And so we're yelling at each other, but like total misses because we do not understand each other. I don't know what's going on for her. She does not know what's going on for me. And uh, it, was, it was really traumatic. So we sort of, somebody broke us up and we kind of backed off and I'm <sighs> like that, right? And I don't know what's happened. I don't know how to resolve it. I, I don't know what to do with the rest of my shift. What I do remember from the time, and so when I think back now, and, and you know, it's easy to look back retrospectively, it's easy to look back with a lot more experience. Um, at the time, I, I recognized that I was very self-concerned in that moment. I was very concerned about how I appeared to others. I was very concerned about my own ego. I was very concerned about that I was hurt in the situation. Um, what I was not so aware of, and which I wish I would have put right at the front is that the care that I needed to give people was being blocked and that's really what I needed to be fighting for. Instead I'm fighting, I know I was fighting sort of out of my ego, you're doing this to me, you're doing that to me, things like that. I'm not really fighting because it's the best thing for my patients and, and that I don't have the resources and it's about their safety, their comfort and what their needs are. In retrospect I realized I, it would have been much better to take a, a track like that. I never resolved that situation with a nurse, ever. Not ever. I, it terrified me. I was actually incredibly uncomfortable with it. I really did not really want to be on the unit. I was on a unit that actually wasn't functioning very well, so communication wasn't very good. I didn't feel like I'd have a lot of support um, to address that or talk about it. Um, and I chose to leave that unit very, very soon after. My orientation is community health nursing, no question, but I never, wor I never worked in a hospital again after that. And that was, that was one of my exits in a hospital. So not the greatest way to, to sort of leave that environment that is, is so wonderful in so many ways. Conflict is really difficult. And um, Fro and I have spoken about this, and I've spoken about this with many of my colleagues. We have a lot of experiences, you know, certainly when we were starting out. So really very much where you guys are right now, um, as RNs new in the career, some of you have a lot of a clinical experience. You've been through a lot more. The, the difficulties and the challenges of trying to work some of this stuff out, especially when you, when you have less experience, especially when you're new on a unit, especially as you're trying to take up these new kinds of roles as well in new ways. I want to move away a, li a little bit from healthcare, and I want to bring this into the theme of space. Um, I, I did talk a bit about aviation the other week. There are lots of parallels between space and aviation and healthcare. The stakes are really high for both industries. People's lives are at risk. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are placed into things. 
there are very complicated processes, tasks, relationships that are happening within this. So what I'd like to first show is um, something that happened. Does anybody remember um, the Space Shuttle Challenger? Yeah. So 30 years ago, it's been the anniversary. It's actually been in the news, right? Quite a bit, a little bit recently. For those of you who don't know, what happened was there was a launching of the Space Shuttle Challenger and it was a, a very well publicized event and one of the reasons why it was well publicized is there was a civilian on the spacecraft for the very first time, um, Krista McAfee, and she was a teacher, young mom, so she was part of the crew that was going up, the seven person crew that was going up. There is an absolute um, Calamity. It's a, it's a catastrophe what happens in this. So this is the footage. So what I'm going to show you is what happened while everybody is watching this live and millions of people, definitely in the United States and internationally, are watching this happen. It's the hydraulic party in the past seven. T-minus 21 seconds and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T-minus 15 seconds. the end is, is they finally say there's obviously a, a major malfunction. Um, it's interesting, it's, it's really said in that very calm, you know, kind of logical voice when, you know, everybody is watching a spaceship in flight, I think it was like 73 seconds after launch, just blow up. Um, unexpectedly, or supposedly unexpectedly, and that's, and that's what we're going to look at today, in the story of the Challenger, what went wrong was an O-ring, a piece of the, the space shuttle that helps protect it when it goes up from, and I, I, don't, I can't even pretend to understand what it is that it, it does, but it keeps, helps keep everything intact, prevents things like a spaceship blowing up. Um, about 24 hours before the launch, there were meetings that were held about the stability of the O-ring at the temperature of which this launch was going to take place at. So the launch is taking place at temperatures less than 53 degrees and it's never been tested 
at, at that temperature. So they do not have the data to show it. So there's lots of reasons why this went awry. In the next two videos I'm going to show you, we can start to look at what went awry here, what went wrong here, who was involved in this, how did these kind of decisions get made. So it fits really well with what we're talking about today, the problem solving, negotiation, conflict resolution is all happening. So what you're seeing here in these other two parts now is the untold story 24 hours prior to this launch actually happening. This is the moment Beaujolais has been waiting for. 
Finally, after a year of memos and calls, he has a chance to be heard. As they gather in the meeting room, the Morton Fire Call team are confident they will be able to stop the launch. Yes. They know NASA would not go against the contractor's recommendation. By 8.45 p.m., the call from NASA is connected. Kennedy Space Center is responsible for all launches. Larry Malloy is NASA's manager of the Solid Rocket Booster Project. The Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama is responsible for all rocket and engine systems. Leading the team is Deputy Director of Science and Engineering, George Farkey. The management team at Morton Five Call is Senior Vice President, Gerald Mason. Joe Kilminster, Vice President of the Space Booster Program. And Robert Lund, Morton Five Call's Vice President of Engineering. By the time the teleconference starts, launch is just 13 hours away. The success of this mission and the lives of the seven astronauts hang on one simple question. How will the O-rings react to the cold temperatures predicted for launch the next morning? At low temperatures, the O-rings are not so elastic. They won't seal properly. And it'll be like uh, putting a, a brick into a crack versus a sponge. And the grease, too, will be affected. It will be thicker and not as slick. We will have a higher O-ring actuation time, and if that happens, we will approach the threshold of secondary seal pressurization capability. So we have a situation where neither the primary seal nor the secondary seal will function. After half an hour, the presentation is finished, and spirits among the engineers at Morton Fire Call are high. confused by your presentation, Thiokol. You're telling me that we can't launch under 53 degrees, yet your own data suggests that you had blow-by on the O-rings when we launched at 75 degrees. The blow-by was definitely worse at the lower temperature. Then Malloy asked for Morton Thiokol's launch recommendation. Their decision comes down to Joe Kilminster. I have maximum of 10% confidence that he's going to stand by what we went into the meeting with, and that was everybody was totally supportive of not launching. And much to my surprise, Kim Metzler answers and says, So I guess our conclusions are that we should not fly outside of our database, which is 53 degrees. And metaphorically inside of my body, I went, Yes! And I was absolutely on top of the world. That lasted for about 10 seconds. The engineers at Morton Fireball are confident NASA will stop the Challenger launch. They now wait for the official response. For God's sake, Martin Thiokol, when do you want me to launch next April? You guys are generating new launch criteria here. No. We have been flying for four years with a known condition in these joints considered and accepted by Thiokol, accepted by me and all levels of NASA management. Think about this. Think about your data. Now, to the layperson, that might not mean much, but to us inside, in the program, fully knowledgeable what's going on, those are metaphorical buzzwords for you screwing up my launch schedule. Only NASA can postpone the launch. All more than Thiokol can do is make a recommendation. Now, Larry Malloy at Kennedy asks George Hardy at Marshall for his opinion. When George speaks, everybody listens because George is one of the most highly recognized engineer managers on the program. I am appalled. But I won't go against the contractor. In that case, I can't recommend launch. It's the second no vote. Because he would not overrule the contractor. But it's also something else. 
Now he said he was appalled. That was a killer. Absolute killer. With their next multi-million dollar contract still under negotiation with NASA, the more than five call managers are under intense pressure. We're going to go to the next one in a minute so you can see how, how this unfolds within this meeting. So what you're seeing happening here is Morton Thiokol is the contractor. They're the ones that make the O-rings and the parts for NASA. And you have the engineers saying that they, there is a problem with these O-rings. This is coming up 24 hours before a launch, which if you can imagine all the planning, all the publicity, everything that's involved in something like this. They're trying to stop the launch. They're trying to work with their managers at Morton Thiokol. And the, ma the engineers and managers at Morton Thiokol are trying to work with the NASA teams as well, the various NASA teams. So I'm going to continue on. Senior Vice President Gerald Mason intervenes. Joe, ask him to take a five minute caucus offline. Larry, could we take five minutes? We have to make a management decision. Let's look over the data again and consider Larry Malloy's points. Right, if we launch at the predicted temperatures, we are out of our experience space. Even if we take 40 degrees as the temperature floor, we are still way out of our database. And launching at these low temperatures, we are moving away from goodness. We're covering the same ground again. We're just spinning our wheels. To the engineer's dismay, the managers ignore them and hold a private conversation. The five minutes soon stretches into half an hour. It's clear the managers are changing their minds. Thompson makes a last ditch effort to stop the launch. And during this so-called private meeting, when we were offline, uh, I could hear the see the way it was going. And I did something I probably would never do again even. I picked up all my charts and went up to the middle of the table because there was a vacant chair there. And I went through the whole thing. Take off 
what's your engineering hat? Put on your managed hat. Mr. Thompson? No, I was not angry. 
Where's the cap? He's out here. Well, does anyone know what his position was? Yes, I uh, talked to him. I said, Jack, what did you really feel? And he said, I would have made that decision, given the information we had that evening. Would or would not? Would have made the same decision. So it may be that he was in agreement. Yes, he was in agreement. Uh, I, I, I can't put it closer than that. And the fourth man name? Uh, Jerry Burns. Uh, I don't know. So all the four we have one don't know, one uh, maybe yes or very likely yes, and two who were first mentioned as being without doubt the seal experts. They both said no. That's all the information I... Okay, so what do you think? What did you see? What happened with that team? What happened with the problem solving, the thinking things through, negotiation, conflict resolution? Like a hierarchy? So people were... You know, it was sort of like, and then they had to like um, let the manager sort of make the final say. Whereas, you know, we were kind of looking for everybody to <coughs> see. So sort of everybody gives input and everybody's voice is heard. In this case, a hierarchy of, of people that ultimately make the decision that they make. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that he was kind of thinking about himself and his position instead of those set, those people in the like that were flying the next day. He wasn't thinking about that exact moment. He was just worried about overstepping his position to speak out. Such a great point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it has a lot to do with the, the room and the hierarchy and the status of people within the room, the power that's operating within that room. It, it's so interesting. And because I find it interesting when I, when I look at these videos, not once do they talk about the astronauts. Not once do the astronauts and this, this civilian teacher mother um, is brought up. It's all about the... the should we launch? It's all about the publicity. It's all about the the O-rings and all the other components, but not about the people that are involved, the people that are really at risk, and and the 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 importance of upholding the safety of those lives in their hands. It's a really really good point. There was another hand up as well. I'm pretty sure that the NASA management team had no idea what the data was in the first place because they were actually saying that the data was conflicting, whereas the engineers were saying a completely different story. Actually, it's interesting. In the bigger story of this, um, there was about a year of trying to, trying to give data about the O-ring and the temperature and the conditions of it that weren't being passed through. Um, in this case, so where we see NASA coming in, here, there's multiple levels of NASA. It actually stops at a more mid-level team and the information isn't communicated even further up to people who, who really needed to be in the know. It actually gets stopped um, at a certain point. They put it down. Why? So you've got people with, with different things at stake here in doing this. Why do you think the company, so the managers in particular at Morton Thiokol, want to have the launch go ahead? What's at stake for them in having it go ahead? Their contract of millions of dollars. Yeah. Their reputation, contract of millions of dollars. They've got a contract on the line, they say in there as well. And how many, with what they do, is very, very specialized. How many, how many people do you think they can work with? Yeah, like NASA, right? They've got to keep NASA happy. They've got lots at stake in making this work out and doing what NASA wants. What's at stake for NASA here in having the launch go? Image? Yeah, image is huge, yeah. 
Yeah, because at this point, um, this is 1986, so there's been the whole big, you know, the, the, the space, uh, man on the moon, things like that. Russia's been beat. So the United States holds this as a, it's a very prestigious program within the States, and it's, it has international press. But it's also become somewhat commonplace that they go into space, people walk on the moon, if you can even imagine. So they're, they're trying to sort of recapture the, the imagination of um, Americans again by having this teacher go up. So they've got the optics, the image at stake. And the image of themselves is, I mean, they have a civilian, as, as space flight being safe, as something safe, and they can manage it and take care of it. They've already had to cancel a few launches already along the way, you found that out, for various problems. They don't want to cancel another launch because it doesn't make them look good. So it's all about their image, it's all about the optics, it's all about the politics of what that is, for sure. Absolutely. Do you feel that the, um, the engineers did enough to speak out? No? Yeah? Well, I mean, they could have simply taken that position of if they're so concerned with the image, the media is obviously going to reflect what is, like, if in the event that a disaster does happen, the media is going to reflect on that. So in that case, all of their efforts would have been completely destroyed instead of postponing the launch by one day where temperatures may have changed. So, so better to have postponed? Is that the... Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a head up. Yeah, and I think um, part of this is that it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. In the hierarchy of um, levels of management, you didn't cross those lines. So you did sort of bow to those that made the decisions. And, and I think that's an example here. Just like parenting 30 years ago. I mean, you were seen and mm -hmm. heard as a child. Whereas now, I mean, it's completely different. We're encouraged to, to have our kids speak out and things. Yeah, yeah. Because you do, you do hear um, Roger Beaujolais, so it's Arnold Thompson and Roger Beaujolais, you do hear him say, when the decision's moving and they say, is there anyone who disagrees? Neither one of them speak out again at that point, when they could have gone on record for doing it. But what do you think's at stake for them in not speaking out, in not pushing it. What's at stake for the engineers? What's that? Yeah, their jobs, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. However, do you, do you feel that they were right or wrong not to speak out more strongly, knowing what they knew, knowing that there, there would very likely be a disaster? I just find that, like, if you take it back to nursing, you're there for your patients. So a lot of times you have doctors coming in and saying that they suggest this or the e teamers suggest this. And I know as me, I've never cared. Like I care what they think, but if I think it's wrong, I've never really thought of my job. It's never really come up in my brain. Do you know what I mean? So for them, like you think, they, you know they care about the astronauts. So at that point, that's the thing is like, you can't be selfish. You have to think. Like, you know you're right, too. I just, I don't know. It just, it angered me that they didn't say anything. Or, or say, they, did, they did try to do a lot, but they didn't that keep, was there, that was there keep pushing. Right? Like, at a big table like that, everybody's fighting and whatnot. That opportunity was given to them. Like, does anybody else have anything they want to say? That's your opportunity. You should just be like, yeah, I do, actually. Because imagine how they would have looked if they had spoken up, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Gonna go back here and then over here. Okay. Isn't there an ethics board in 30 about how the law has happened that we would have to respond to as well? I mean, you are putting someone's life at risk, and obviously this woman had a huge effect on other people as well, so I'm just asking. Because it, I feel like the way it was really carried out wasn't similar in ways it would have been carried out today. I, I think it's somewhat hard to like compare it to today exactly. There was a very, very large commission that was assigned after this in an investigation to find out what happened and correct what happened. And, you know, true to our lives, sometimes our best 
we don't want anything like this to happen where people's lives are, are put in jeopardy or, or ended but sometimes the, you know the learning happens as we go along and we write and as as we make mistakes and looking at processes like this absolutely but there's no question that the mechanisms of communication the mechanisms of problem solving for people to be able to speak up for conflict resolution are not in place in this team at that particular time it's interesting because I think what NASA would say and as we would say in healthcare because it brings up about uh, like our, our patient safety agendas which are huge and everywhere right now, NASA would say their, their agenda would be about, about safety, about the safety of these flights, the safety about sending people into space and having them come back. Um, what you see here is, a, is really does seem like they have forgotten that that is their mission. That is the principle on which they're operating. I would say too that the engineers may have forgotten too that, that their job is to safeguard the safety of that crew and that passengers. And did you notice, and I've, I love the line in it, where the the manager at Morton Thiel call, he's an engineer manager position, and so, somebody from NASA turns to him, I think it's from NASA, turns to him and says, okay, I want you to take off your engineer hat and now be the manager. Did you notice that? Yeah, so when would you ever do that? If you were a healthcare provider in an administrative role, when would you ever take off your your nursing, physician, OT, PT, when would you ever put that aside to be a manager, only a manager thinking about maybe resources, bottom line, other things? Would that ever happen? Yes. For the budget. According to our, how we're regulated, should that ever happen? And the answer is no, it can never happen. We are regulated health providers. We can never, ever put that aside, ever. Doesn't matter what job we do, we, we never put it aside. Um, I just noticed that the engineers were very, like, <clears throat> very clear on what they were saying originally, and I think that they really counted their point in. Like, they said basically, absolutely not, absolutely not. And then the guy at NASA said, in other terms, basically, like, that's not going to work for me. And then their manager turned the phone off and said, that's not going to work for us. So I think that you can stand there and sort of like fight your fight as much as you want. But at the end of the day, if someone says, what's your opinion, and you give it without a shadow of a doubt, you say it's absolutely this. And that person essentially says to you, that's not the answer that I wanted to hear. Like, you can only drive your head into a brick wall so many times. Like, at some point, you're talk literally talking to a brick wall. So I kind of think that although the consequences were great in this situation, the engineers clearly felt like they're not going to speak because no matter what they said in that situation, they weren't going to be listened to. I, it's interesting. I think you brought up a really good, it's a pivotal moment in the film where things look like they're pushing through and the engineers feel that their managers at Morton Thiel call around their side were all agreed, should not launch. And then the person from NASA turns around and says, you know, I'm like, I'm appalled that you're bringing this up now. I will not go against your recommendation if you say we should not launch. But by saying I'm appalled, the message is really clear. I am really unhappy with this decision. It is not okay for you to make this decision. And that person, it's about power, right? That, that particular individual there who spoke had a lot of power. And that's where you see the managers then start to backtrack, right? Because their multi-million dollar contract is being renewed. Especially as their multi-million dollar contract is being renegotiated by exactly those people. Yeah, they start to back. That's a pivotal moment where it shifts, the dynamic shift. Um, and nobody, but nobody also takes that on, right, to challenge it. Nobody, nobody looks at that and sees for what it is. And I know it's really complex, but nobody takes it on right in that moment. They let that hang and they let it keep moving. I, I think there is a value of saying when we disagree with things, processes that are happening, whether or not we can stop them. Sometimes we can't. Some things are out of our control. There's no question. And it's a little bit like this O-ring, right? They do not have conclusive data here. They don't really know what's going to happen. It's never really been tested yet. So they don't, they don't know for sure. They can't say absolutely. People are looking for black and white answers in this situation. There are no black and white answers in this situation, which is actually very true of our practices, right? A lot of times we do not have all the data, all the information at our fingertips as we are trying to decision make. 
So we're trying to make the decision amongst the, sort of the best information. We have using the best principles that we can. In this, in this instant, the principle is safety. It's about safety, and that's what gets sort of falls away here. They forget to rest on safety. And you hear that in that one person who says, and I love the line, it's a move away from goodness. The action that we are taking is a move away from goodness. And that's the kind of thing I think we can ask ourselves, even if we don't know the right or wrong of it or the yes or no of it, is what I'm doing, is what I'm about to agree to, say to, take action on, is that going to move me away from goodness? And I, lo I love the way that that line was phrased, and apparently that's a, that's a true, this is a fictionalized account, but apparently that was a, a, like a true statement that this particular um, engineer had made. Yeah, so at the end of the day, NASA was trying to protect its image. It's all about the optics. However, it actually really damaged its image. Yeah. Damaging to the, the space, the sort of the space program and things like that. Okay, so let's go on and talk a little bit then about problem solving. So we saw, we saw some aspect of problem solving. Um, we saw some aspect of conflict resolution, negotiation, not even conflict resolution, conflict uh, negotiation that did not work out so well. Um, so in terms of problem solving, so problem solving is really about trying to find a solution um, that is different from anything that already exists. So something that doesn't exist yet, we're trying to figure out um, and come to that. Um, it's trying to look at those kind of alternatives. What else could be? What else could we do? Um, it's trying to, in a lot of ways, it's trying to invent something. Um, we know that problem solving, and we said this over and over, happens best in the context of a team because of the diversity of perspectives, opinions. We don't just rely on the managers and Morton Thiokol who have a stake in making sure that they get the next contract so that the launch goes, or NASA who needs it for their publicity goes. We listen to the engineers who have a different point of view. We listen to other people. So we need those diversity of opinions to give um, very, very different points of view. And I don't know if anybody read the paper today, but there was in the Toronto Star, um, there was a call, that they looked at um, gender diversity among uh, many of the top companies, um, so looking at CEOs, top management teams, um, and women are doing very, very poorly in representation within top management companies. And one of the recommendations was gender diversity starts bringing better solutions. We need to start diversifying who, who these people are that are running these companies. Um, so they made a really good, a good point when they said that. Um, so it's a structured and complex process consisting of a set of activities designed to analyze a problem systematically and generate, implement, and evaluate uh, solutions. So although we problem solve every minute of the day, we're always doing problem solving. It's natural to who we are as people. Um, there are ways that we can do it more systematically to work towards better outcomes. And it requires three things. So it requires that we understand the type of problem, issue or challenge that the team is facing. And to really get a sense what is the problem, what really is the problem. So in this case, is the problem the O-rings, is it the publicity, is it the launch, is it the safety? This team actually wasn't clear on what the real problem was. They knew it was the O-rings, but what did, what did that mean in the context to help them make their decision, the bigger context to that? Then we need to decide on an approach or strategy to help solve it. And decision making is a part of problem solving, but it is not problem solving in its, itself. You need, it's a bigger process when you go through problem solving. And then we need to look at the result. Um, we need to apply the result uh, efficiently and effectively. And we need to look at it. We need to evaluate. Did it do what we thought it would do? Do we need to go back and do something else? There are many problem solving models out there and I know you've been exposed to some throughout your education, throughout your lives. We're going to feature one here in this course, um, but to talk a little bit about the, the uh, 
models all in general there's some very common features um, so first of all it's the idea that problem solving is a learned process it's maybe natural but to learn to do it well and to do it effectively we learn how to do it and certainly when we just try and um, like hit on various solutions and we're kind of spontaneous we don't always come out with the best outcomes so it's this idea of it needs to be systematic we need to look at the stages um, that take us different um, take us through the process we need to identify those stages to help us understand what is all involved in problem solving and, and the kind of things that we need, the factors we need to consider, the, the resources, the material, the people, um, who and we can think of the organizing framework in this context. So problem solving is a process but we need to think about the, the people involved, we need to think about the tasks involved, all the processes involved and the contextual factors. And it's not linear it's not a straightforward process. Wouldn't it be nice if it was? We could just problem, figure it out, resolve it, done. Um, but it usually doesn't happen that way. It's usually much more um, iterative than that, which means it's more you know, sort of cyclical. We start to solve the problem. Maybe what we thought was a problem shifts in some way. We've got to re go back and redefine the problem, generate different types of possible possible solutions, make other decisions, we evaluate as we go. So it's a much more fluid, much more kind of circular overlapping kind of process. And although models vary, they all have these kind of common features. They look, they need to identify the problem. So very clearly you need to look and say, be able to say, here is the problem you need to seek to resolve the problem in some way. You need to figure out how you're going to do that. That's very action orientated. You need to develop a number of solutions. So you don't just decide on the, the first solution that comes along um, or the one that everybody initially jumps to and agrees on. You need to look at a, a variety of different solutions and evaluate those to choose the best one. And it's a little bit for those of you in nursing and your learning plans where we asked you kind of to systematize, right, your, your learning. And I know they're not always very popular and you're like, oh, learning plan. But it's the same sort of thing. We're asking you to be really systematic, to think about what are your goals, what do you want to do. You're not necessarily defining a problem, but you're setting very clear goals and how you're going to get to them and show how you're going to, how you're going to show that you actually met that. It's to put in this, this strong um, kind of um, um, system to help you get there. We're going to look at the McClam and Woodside model of problem solving. Um, that's the one that is really highlighted in the book. And there are three phases to this. So problem identification, decision making, problem um, resolution. So problem identification, it's about collaboration and collaboration always being important. But of those involved in the problem, really important, the key players need to be involved in defining the problem, coming up with solutions, and moving towards it. Sometimes we might, for example, leave um, the patient. It, the, we may decide that the patient has a problem, uh, but we never talk to the patient about it. We decide that we're going to intervene and do something in some way, but we've never brought that particular person into our conversations, into our discussions. The person themselves may define the problem in a, in a completely different way than we do. The textbook itself gives a good example right at the beginning when it talks about um, a situation with Mrs. Wang. If you've read the opening vignette, Mrs. Wang, um, she lives with depression and she has diabetes. And one of the things that she's concerned about, she stopped taking her insulin because what it does is it takes away her chi, it takes away her energy, and having energy is really important to her. The team comes in to try and help to resolve this and find out what she needs. And as the team comes together, there's people that support, but there's a person on the team who says that she is non-compliant with her medication. The problem is her non-compliance. That's, that's that particular provider's definition of the problem. That is not the problem that the patient sees. The problem the patient sees is I have a lack of energy. What I am doing is taking away my energy. So 
how we define what that problem is means how we will look for solutions. So having everybody involved, understanding a common, uh, common understanding of the problem is really important. Understanding the expectations, um, making sure we have clear identification. Then we would move to decision making. So that's a, a much more active process, selecting goals. We look at the options, uh, make decisions based on that. And then we move into um, problem resolution. So it's all those activities, the planning, taking action, and our final evaluation. Um, coming back to look at the outcome, because we're always looking for an outcome, but also the process that we went through as well. And we're going to look at each one of these in a little bit more detail in a minute. What I'm going to do is take you back to our theme of space, and we're going to look at a situation that looks at problem solving, a very good example of problem solving. Does, does anybody know Apollo 13? Have you seen the movie? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Fantastic movie, Tom Hanks. Um, for those of you who don't know, so Apollo 13 was one of the, the space missions. It was 1970. Apollo 13 was actually a, if you can say routine, because nothing I think in space is routine. It's a trip to the moon. They're meant to. I think it was the third mission to the moon. They're meant to get to the moon, walk around, do samples. It was going to be tele televised on TV. Um, still, you know, a pretty major event in, in the history, the space history. What happens in Apollo 13 as they're, as they're hours into the flight, very, very far into the flight, is they do some housekeeping. They do some routine things that they need to do to take care of the, the spaceship itself. One of the things they need to do is stir some vats, and it has something to do with the oxygen. As they do this, a malfunction, something occurs creates explosions, creates problems, and they have a multiple, sort of this multiple problems start happening all over the place. And they have to sort out what is the problem. The whole movie, I wish we could watch the whole movie here, the whole movie is about problem solving. So what happens is the oxygen in their space capsule ends up getting vented out. So there's an oxygen problem. They need oxygen for the fuel, and I can't tell you why in any ways, but it's really important to the fuel consumption as well. So they have that. So now there's a fuel problem. So they've got to, they've got to solve these two things. So what they do find as they go through, they are no longer able to get, they're not going to go to the moon and walk out on the moon. That's an impossibility. They need to figure out, can we even get back home? Are we going to survive this? That's their task at hand. How do we start solving these problems? As it turns out, their most immediate problem, yes, oxygen is a problem, but they have barely enough. They work out the fuel because they move into, from the space shuttle into what's called the limb, and it helps them to be able to get back to Earth by going around the moon. But what becomes the big problem? Because they have to go into the, what's called the, the, the limb, the LEM, lunar module, is that they are building up O2, CO2, in this module without the capacity to be able to expel it. And the CO2, so way before they have to worry about, am I going to get home safely? Am I going to die in the next few hours or, or, in, or next you know, day? Because the CO2 is building up and how are we going to resolve this? So this is, this is the team, the NASA team back at Kennedy Space Center and the team up in space trying to problem solve this.
we had a uh, an unusual procedure for you here. Once you have to cut off the flight one. It was a pleasure. My dog side like canister. We have two living my dog side like canisters, I'm sorry. Uh, roll of great tape. Okay, so so an example of problem solving in a, an extreme situation. So let's um, let's talk more. Going back to the model, the McLaren and Woodside model. So let's look at the three phases. So remember three phases. Right now we're looking at the first phase, so problem identification phase. In this case, the problem clearly first problem, priority problem, CO2. Fix that. Um, so there's a number of steps that need to, you preferably, would need to happen um, when we're identifying what the problem is itself. So generally what it is, we know that something's going on, we know that something needs to change, there needs to be some kind of goal, maybe we know we want to get here, but we, we've got to figure out how we're going to get there, like how do we go from here to there. Um, so state the problem, so detailed description, um, often problems are very complex, in this situation very complex because there were multiple problems, had the, some that were a bit combined and they had to pull them apart. They had to look at one, CO2 first, right, priority because you're going to die very quickly if you don't, if you're not able to expel that, if you can't figure out how to get those filters working properly. Then figure out how are we going to have enough fuel to get back home, how does our oxygen last to get back home, you know, it's boom, boom, boom. So state the problem or the problems. And then check the assumptions, so what kind of assumptions are being made? In the example that um, I gave about the, the situation with Mrs. Wang in the vignette, do we think we, we know what this particular person wants and her daughter? Are we making an assumption about what we think is going on? Have we asked her? Have we checked that out? Do we know actually what is really happening and what kind of assumptions are being made about it? Um, verify if a real problem exists. Does a real problem exist? Or is it just something that is bothering you so you think it's a problem but there actually isn't a problem at hand that needs to be addressed? Um, and then look, how do all members, because remember we're doing this in a team context. This is not individual problem solving. This is a team process problem solving and that's much more difficult. So how does everybody understand? And then to prioritize. So look at what you need to look at first. And then you're going to move to the decision making phase. So that's three steps. The setting of the goal is really, really important. You have to know where you want to get to to be able to problem solve, to make action to get to where you're going to go to. 
So the, the goal is that statement of intent, and you guys have known this because you've written lots of goals. It's where do you want to be, where do you want to get to, the intended desire or the outcome. Then what you want to do is you need to generate alternatives. And sometimes brainstorming is really good, and that's where everybody just sits down and throws out whatever, no censorship. You just throw out whatever. As cre you're being as creative, just like in that example. So it's not just critical thinking. You have to be creative as well, so you bring in the creativity. You throw it all out there. And then, of course, you're going to remove things if they're unethical, if they you know, don't make any sense because you couldn't possibly ever do them in, in real life and things like that. So you, you're looking at all those, but you're trying to keep things open, as open as possible, very much like you see in that example when they're trying to problem solve. They take all the materials that they would have up in space, they dump it on a table, and they just start playing to try and figure it out. How can we make this work with only this when I can't do anything other than this? So it's generating those alternatives and then it's making the decision. It's going with something. Looking at all of it. And there's different ways that people make decisions among teams. Again, I was talking about teams. It may be through delegation. You might be on teams where you bring all the information, you talk about the problem, you look at all the solutions and then you look to the leader the team leader, you look to a subgroup, you look to the expert, the person who seems best likely to be able to make the decision at that point. You may do, and that's delegation, you may delegate the decision to somebody. You also could take a vote where everybody puts their hands up and the vote and the, the majority rules. You could do it that way. Um, and then you can also come to consensus. And we tend to want to come to consensus a lot. Coming to consensus is very, very... Um, time-consuming a lot of times and as we saw in the film so with the challenger what appears to be consensus in that room right is anybody in disagreement if you do not agree speak now and nobody speaks everybody appears to be in consensus is that true consensus were people really in consensus in that room or were there other things operating other than fatigue. You know that there's a lot of power dynamics in that room. People feel like they can't speak or they've spoken so much and they're not being heard. That is not consensus. That is not true consensus. True consensus happens when everybody um, has a voice. Everybody willingly participates um, in deciding what happens. So how do you increase the likelihood of success of decisions? So there's a few things. Um, applied in a consistent, impartial manner, uh, using accurate information. We see in the film that there is information. It's not necessarily accurate or, or absolute information. A lot of times in our career, and I think healthcare is ve it, you know, very true, maybe like space, we're making decisions when we don't have all the information. Some of it may be accurate. Some of it may never have been tested and we still have to make decisions and do something. We still have to go ahead and do something with that. Um, have an opportunity to evaluate and think about it before we do it, so if it just doesn't rush ahead, that we can evaluate it. Um, that we're making sure that it is the thinking about the patients, very much what doesn't happen in that film. That we're thinking about the safety of that crew. This is thinking about the interests of the patients and anybody else involved. Anybody else involved. And in fact, I would suggest that in the film, because the idea of NASA as space travel as being so safe, nobody is actually safeguarding the mandate of NASA when they make the decision that they make. Nobody is actually taking care of NASA's mandate to be able to have safe flights, to be able to have the space program, the government paid for the space program because it works and it does things. Nobody actually is thinking that, they're thinking of one launch only. Um, make sure you involve everybody who's, who's important to it, and then keeping with professional standards and practice ethics. And again, we don't ever abandon what we, who we are as regulated health professionals and the ethics that we hold. And then we move into the problem resolution phase. Um, and that's when we're getting ready to actually really do something to solve the problem. Um, and we need to look at all the strategies. We just, you know, take another really close look, look at the goals. We need to, you know, really think about how we've gotten there, but change also. Is there a readiness for change? 
Do we have the resources that we need to make the change happen? Are people on board with it? Does everybody understand this is happening? Those people that will be affected by it. Is some kind of solution for a problem just being imposed on people without them understanding the bigger picture, what their role is, how it will affect them? You have to assess all those things because change is, is, you know, is very difficult for most people. Develop the plan of action. Ensure that the problem has not changed, just so like in this. Is the O2 the problem or has it suddenly become the, the CO2 being the problem? And then you carry it out. And final evaluation. We always do final evaluations. Usually we do evaluations that are formative while things are happening. They're called formative evaluations and summative at the end. Formative helps us go back and revise, rethink as we move through. Um, let's talk about some of the challenges. I think we talked a lot about this when we talked about Spaceship Challenger. So there's some really common problems when teams come together to try and problem solve. And that is difference in thinking styles. And we all think really differently. Some people are really, they think really linearly, right? They move, here's the problem, here's the solution, we move ahead like this. Other people are really divergent thinkers, they're creative, they're all over the place in how they, how they do things and how they put things together. We have people like that coming together that are trying to talk across a team. There can be um, resistance among team members. That can be resistant to actually the process of problem solving itself. I don't know if you've been in a situation where you need to do something, a group gets together and everybody just wants to do it, they want it to go away, let's just do that, let's just do it. Nobody's actually talking about what can be done, what really is the problem. Are there a bunch of solutions? Can we pick the best one? Everybody just jumps on because they don't want to engage in a process of problem solving. Because it is onerous um, and it is hard and sometimes problems really just are very complex. Um, inadequate discussion is very big. Often we don't have time within our team meetings, time within our busy schedules to be able to adequately discuss things together as groups. We try and use a lot of mechanisms, emails, things like that, but it can be really difficult. Sometimes team members um, themselves can lack kind of communication skills, good communication skills. We've seen some of that. Sometimes the, the group hasn't been together very long and hasn't gone through those stages, isn't really well formed, doesn't know how to talk very well together yet. What you see actually in the Apollo 13 is very high functioning teams coming together, being able to problem solve very high level problems. Those are teams that have worked together for a long period of time. There can be polarization, um, and that's, and maybe you've been in a situation like that. That's when people get together, there's a problem, something's happening. So maybe it's your place of work and there's a problem comes up. The team gets together and everybody becomes very extreme about that problem. It either becomes really terrible or really overblown or somebody gets made into the problem when they're actually, you know, just a player within the problem. It's when polarization, everybody just gets really, really extreme within it. And it tends to, um, tends to kind of cloud what the real issue is, what the problem is. It actually is a diversion in a lot of ways. And then groupthink, which we saw a lot of today. That's really what we saw happening in the example of the challenger where there seems to be, and it happens a lot actually when there's where power dynamics, when there are things at stake for one particular group that tends to have more power and status among the entire group. And people sort of join on, everybody goes in the same direction, nobody starts questioning anything. The group gets together almost as one force and nobody will challenge, nobody will offer anything new. That can be the climate doesn't allow it, it can be that people themselves are unwilling or um, feel very uncomfortable and are very unpracticed at doing things like that. So if we look at conflict, and we saw a lot of that, the process that occurs when team members um, engage in a struggle rooted in difference, belief, thoughts, attitudes, feelings and behavior, it's inevitable in teams, we'll always see this. 
but what we want to get to in problem solving is part of this. It's those methods that can be used to address conflict, and that's at the interpersonal levels. Um, it can be between different groups of people in the Challenger, NASA, Morton Thiokol, engineers, managers, there's multiple groups that are involved, multiple levels all playing out at once that are happening. So it's ways to try and address these kind of common problems that we see within teams to get to better solutions. And you guys will know these really well. So what happens when we have differences of opinion? We're trying to go through a problem solving process. We all bring different things to the table and we get locked in different positions or we do different things within groups. And this has a lot of gain to do with our personality, our comfort within groups, how we've learned to respond within a group. So in ways to try to deal with conflict, some of the things that happen, and you guys know, may, you may be one of these people, and you know people that also do these things. So competition or fighting, and that, that is trying to force someone to your point of view. So that example that I gave at the very beginning when I am yelling at the nurse who is yelling at me, we are both trying to be heard, we are not listening to each other, we are trying to force our opinion on each other. We're trying to bend each other to do, to do what we want the other person to do. We're not doing anything else, that's exactly what we're doing. We're using force. Um, we're, we're using fighting. You can avoid, so inaction may be a way. You don't do anything. You sit in a meeting, you don't do anything. That can be really passive and it can be um, it can be a real blocker in terms of resolving conflict. Do you think it can also be helpful sometime in resolving conflict by not taking action? And yeah, it can be. Sometimes the problem is not yet, yet really defined very well by the team. Sometimes there's other processes that need to come into play. Sometimes time helps a little bit. Um, so sometimes inaction is not actually a bad thing. A lot of times it is, it means the group isn't moving or doing anything, but sometimes it actually can work to the advantage of a team. Collaborating or cooperating, that's when the, we've talked about this all through the course, the creative solutions, coming together, acceptable to all pro, uh, parties, everybody involved. Accommodating and yielding, so that's when there's um, the sa somebody sort of sacrifices or both parties sacrifice, they give up something to get somewhere together. It sometimes can be effective as long as it doesn't compromise main principles like patient safety. And then there's the compromising, um, which really only satisfied some people. So those are some of the tactics that you would use, could be used. And then finally, we're getting to some of the basic steps. So how do we do it? What could have gone on better in that situation of the challenger. So set the atmosphere. Could not the people, that team, instead of 24 hours before that launch, knowing a year in advance there were problems with the O-rings, could they have not started setting the environment and the processes in place to start talking and dealing about this? And they could have. They actually had ample time to do it. The atmosphere the night before a launch was an absolutely inappropriate time to come together and try and deal with this. So that didn't work. So setting the atmosphere, clarifying perceptions, understanding where people are coming from, how they're thinking. Making sure we're looking at the real issue. We're not looking at problems that don't actually exist or don't really exist. That we're all in agreement. So in the case of the, the patient, Mrs. Wang, is the real issue non-compliance? We can say non-compliance, she's still not going to take the insulin because it takes away her energy. If we say it's non-compliance, we're never going to be able to problem solve that, right? It's never going to work because the real issue is we need to help her to feel better. The issue is her, her sense of herself and her sense of her energy. That's the real problem. So develop a doable plan and implement coming together. And then again, we always go back and we evaluate the outcomes. So that's problem solving, conflict resolution, and negotiation in a nutshell. Any questions?